time, and I call the Assistant Minister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I want to join uh, my friend and colleague, the member for Barawa, in speaking on this important bill before the House today. And it's my pleasure, really, to get up and speak about this, having chaired the Parliamentary Friends of India for the past uh, three years here in Canberra, working very closely with the Indian diaspora in our major cities, Sydney and Melbourne, but also here in Canberra to ensure that parliamentarians are across uh, the important relationship that we do have with India and the ongoing uh, increase in trade, in volumes of migration, in the partnership that we share in our region to make sure that we have a safe, stable and economically prosperous region. And we do understand, I think, in this House now that this relationship is really finding its feet between our two great nations. For the first time in 30 years, we saw the visit of Prime Minister Modi, one of the most significant modern leaders of India, um, coming out of the Bharatiya Janata Party, um, with a real promise for economic reform and growth uh, for India, uh, having delivered that in the Gujarat province. Uh, really now seeing for the first time the modernization of the Indian economy uh, on the precipice of great growth that we saw in China on the precipice of great development, uh, real opportunity for uh, the great partnership between Australia and India to emerge in this century as one of the defining features of our bilateral relationship um, with India. Uh, we see, of course, uh, the relationship between our prime ministers. We see now that the largest source country for migrants in my own portfolio um, is now India. Uh, our largest student uh, source uh, country is uh, variously India. Many foreign students now studying in Australia and the skill shortages, the skills needs of India is one of the great export opportunities for our education sector here in Australia. It's the world's third largest and fastest growing major economy. But currently, of course, Deputy Speaker, exports to India are about just a tenth of China. Uh, they present us with a significant potential and opportunity to expand and hence this bill before us uh, presents us with a great opportunity to continue this strong economic relationship and provide the power, the needs, the, the real needs that an emerging and growing economy such as, as India will require. We know, of course, Deputy Speaker, that India is now a, a stronger regional and global partner emerging in our region with a great global role, um, a large democratic power in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it means more outreach with us, it means more trade, it means more diplomacy, it means more cooperation between us. Uh, and our bilateral relationship has developed so fast over the last five years. I think this is an important step in the right direction. Um, it has had some misguided opposition in the past. I note this bill and the sale of uranium to India. And I don't think there's any Australian, I don't think there's anyone here left in this House that would want to see a return to the era under the Rudd government where I was here in this House where a strain was placed on our relationship uh, with this uh, major strategic partner to our detriment. Um, the success that Australia has long sought, the access that India has sought to our uh, uranium ore uh, to meet the needs of its rapidly growing economy um, is so important to understand. Um, from a psychological perspective uh, from our Indian partners. And I think for a, uh, Australia at any point to have suggested that we would deny our uranium to India, uh, that there was no way of working out how we could arrange the provision of uranium to a country like India, which we have so much in common with, democracy, um, uh, use of the English language, uh, uh, shared uh, British heritage, um, of colonialism, things that we relate to so well with India, that there is no way that we could form a bond of trust and an economic tie, a binding contract, a relationship with, to ensure that we were satisfied, that we'd meet our international obligations, that India would meet theirs, I think was naive. And it was naive of the Labor Party at the time to think so. It was good to see the Gillard government reverse the Rudd government's, um, uh, uh, I think, error in this regard. And uh, it's good to see the opposition supporting this bill as well, because it is the right move for the relations between our countries. It is the right move forward for our country and for India. And uh, the rhetoric, I think, has to change. We must recognise essentially that India is now a responsible no nation and strengthening our bilateral relationship is mutually beneficial. And I think it's important to see uh, the uh, member for Melbourne um, and the member for Denison here, and I, I know they're here preemptively. I might preempt him a little bit what they say, but all members of this House should understand that the modern nation that India is and that it represents uh, and the good global and international citizen that it is. And it's this government's objective. We want to ensure that our exports are properly managed, that they are dealt with uh, in, in 
full confidence of the standards that we require. And that's what this bill provides for. The bill provides guidance for the approval of uranium exports. Um, it takes into account the particular safeguard arrangements um, that the IAEA applies in India, which India has committed to apply in respect of Australian exports of uranium through its new nuclear cooperation agreement with Australia. These arrangements, I'm confident, can assure the House, the Parliament, the public, uh, our two nations, that there will be robust uh, arrangements that Australian uranium uh, will be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. Uh, and the design is specific to India, which of course is not a party uh, to the NPT. The purpose of this bill is to clarify that decisions approving civil nuclear transfers to India are taken not to be inconsistent with or have been made with due regard to Australia's obligations relating to nuclear safeguards under the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty and the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone Treaty. If particular conditions are met, the conditions relate to the application of India's nuclear safeguards agreement with the IAEA, including its additional protocol, as well as the agreement between the Government of Australia and the Government of India on cooperation in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, the Australia-India Agreement. And given the expanse of nuclear energy around the globe and the use in many modern countries like France and now in India and China as well, um, of course we have to have these arrangements and these treaties and, and this confidence that uranium is being used for civilian and peaceful purposes like power generation. And we shouldn't allow blind ideology to get in the way of these important technological developments that allow uh, not, uh, not just for millions of people to escape poverty and to better themselves and improve their lives and have access to uh, cheaper power and better uh, constant sources of power for industry and for their own endeavour, but also significantly, and I know the member from Melbourne would agree, to reduce our reliance on fossil fuel-based power over time, to take advantage of the technological take advantage of the technological solutions that are available to human beings, to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, um, to generate baseload energy in, in, a, in a reliable and cheap way for the vast expansions that economies like India will require. And if we do cut ourselves off from these technological solutions, I'd say to the member for Melbourne, if we do cut ourselves off from technology, we will not be able to save the problems that face us. So it's good to see modern economies and modern nations like India, France, uh, you know, other parts of the world taking on board um, available technological solutions to power generation, uh, dealing with the problems of climate change, um, dealing with the challenges faced by uh, emerging economies and doing so in a sensible way. And that's what this bill is assisting Australia also to do in, in the provision of uranium for civil purposes and nuclear power generation. Uh, and Deputy Speaker, I think the public can uh, retain its confidence in the provisions that are in this bill and the negotiations that this government has undertaken um, with the government of India uh, and the protocols that are in place um, and the requirements that Australia has put in place uh, and the developments in the arrangements for nuclear cooperation. Um, I, I will, of course, not reiterate everything that has been said by previous speakers in relation to the details. However, I would just uh, ensure that people understand that uh, the bill codifies for the special case of India the content of Australia's relevant international obligations for the purposes of the relevant laws. The bill will give the legal and commercial certainty to specific developments in this bilateral relationship, um, include a new bilateral maritime exercise, an agreed framework for security cooperation, incorporating meetings on cyber policy, counterterrorism and maritime cooperation, and continuation of the Foreign Minister's Framework Dialogue. Continued growth, of course, in the people-to-people -people links, the collaborations in science, education and technology, and the conclusion of the Nuclear Cooperation Agreement. Engagement, as you might know, Deputy Speaker, in Australia from Indian ministers has improved, and we've seen the Prime Ministerial visit, but of course we've seen minister after minister, senior ministers, uh, Finance Minister Jaitley and Coal and Energy Minister Goyal. Uh, uh, finding a way, of course, to normalise the nuclear status of India has been a central part of this shift that we have seen in recent years. Uh, I believe that the bilateral relationship between India and Australia has been greatly strengthened uh, by our support for its campaign for membership of the Nuclear Suppliers Group. Uh, and the support that Australia has provided in this regard has reinforced uh, the impression of us as a reliable partner as a uh, honest broker and, of course, as a good regional ally, um, uh, as, uh, as India has uh, attested to. 
in setting up the new safeguard arrangements, of course, with the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency and concluding nuclear cooperation agreements with countries like the United States, Canada and Australia, India has been willing, I think, for the first time to bind itself to the international standard safeguard arrangements over its declared civil nuclear sector. And it's very important to remember that those arrangements now exist between the United States, Canada uh, and, uh, of course, now Australia. Uh, India, as I've said, uh, Deputy Speaker, offers a significant new market for Australian uranium. Successive Australian governments now have worked with India to put in place the nuclear cooperation agreement and the administrative arrangements to allow exports to proceed for civil power generation. Uh, it is important, uh, Deputy Speaker, that we pass this bill. It's important that we speak with tolerance and respect about our Indian allies when we make our contributions in this House, recognising that they are a peaceful power, that they are using our uranium for peaceful purposes, uh, that they are, of course, by generating power through nuclear power, given the rapid expansion that is expected in the Indian economy, making a great contribution in reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well, Deputy Speaker. So when we do seek to make our contributions here today, I hope all members of the chamber will be respectful of that relationship and of that certainty that is required between two great countries like India and Australia. Because it is important that Australians as well consider uh, and continue to consider, and successive Australian governments continue to consider, that we must access technological solutions to the challenges that face our country as well. And it is good to see attitudes changing towards nuclear science, medicine, technology, and hopefully power generation in the near future in, in Australia and uh, in the development of our country as well. And when you look at the attitudes that have been here in the past, when you look at the fact that we will be exporting uranium to countries around the world, when you look at uh, the major unions in this country relaxing and removing their opposition, historic opposition, to important um, developments in uranium, you can see the grounds are shifting in support of what is and what can be a great technological solution uh, to the power generation needs of our country as well. So it's my pleasure today to recommend this bill to the House. I think it is an extremely significant development between uh, India and Australia. Uh, this will form the platform of great trade between our two countries for the expansion of the Indian economy that we all want to see in the world today. And it will mean, of course, peaceful collaboration, peaceful cooperation uh, in our region uh, with enhanced uh, economic development and economic trade. And that's something we can all recommend. So, uh, Deputy Speaker, I uh, welcome this bill. I welcome the continued ongoing trust and uh, a mutual uh, uh, development between the bilateral relationship of Australia and India, uh, and I commend the bill to the House. I thank the Honourable Assistant Minister for Immigration and Border Protection.